Hello all, it's the old geek and I'm here with another read through of the dragon. Now if you remember in my last video where I read through Dragon 31, I did inform you that uh, I was going to take a little bit of a break from reading through magazines after I got to the end of 1979 and this is the last issue of 1979, it's number 32, now costing $2.50. So after this one I'm going to have a little bit of a break from reading magazines, I'll bring it back, bring this series back uh, sometime in the non too distant future but i do want to have a go at a few do, doing a few other things so um this is of course the december 1979 edition and it is christmas the dragon peace on earth a christmas tree super lifelike toy soldiers opening fire on a small boy who is hiding behind the sofa. Okay. It's clearly a, a bit of fun, this image. It's not the greatest artwork in the world, but it it is. It's mildly amusing, and it's suitable for Christmas. And look at these uh, stockings above the fire. Tim and TSR. I quite like this cover. It's it, It's got a bit of humour to it. It's got a bit, and that's... Do you want to see from time to time? A little bit of humour. Right, adverts. Well, Papa. And this is the cover to cover thing that they started last uh, last issue, which is just a, a bit more of a description of what people are going to find in this issue. I think this is 64 pages, this one, so it's quite big. But if you notice, the cover price is up to $2.50, so they have, as their Christmas present, to all you good gamers out there, they've increased the price by 50 cents. But they've given you a few more pages for that. To be honest, $2.50 for a 64 page magazine? That's not too bad. It's not too bad. Right. So the first, this is the editorial bit where they talk about what's in the magazine. Uh, so Sorcerer Squall, Sage Advice, the Omens, Tiny Hut, the Druid in Fact and Fantasy, the Fell Pass, winning IDDC entry. No, I don't remember that. I'll have to look at that. Fancy Smith's Notebook and Dragon's Bestiary. Variants, Poisons from AA to XX. Aquatic Encounters with Mega Flora. Spells for the Very Smart Sorcerer, the Traveller poli travel Politician. WRG rules modifications, and you've got um, WRG, WRG, don't know, um, Samurai, Middle C, and short takes and first impressions, reviews, humour, um, background, weapons of the Far East, ooh, wow, that'd be interesting, that'd be on page six as well, then we've got news and views, Dragon Rumbles out on a limb, convention schedule, okay, okay. Dragon Rumble's on page two. Are they saying that this is page one here? Because, look, well, I don't know. I suppose, you, do you start as from page one inside? Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Dragon Rumble's. Right, it looks like Tim Cask is talking about how the uh, the job has changed, how because the magazine has become bigger. So he's probably justifying the price rise. And look, the six, it was two dollars for a thirty-two page magazine, and then it grew, and then it grew some more, and now it's sixty-four pages. I don't think anyone would complain that that. That there's a small increase in the cover price. So, uh, happy Christmas, whether you ce celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, Winter Solstice, or whatever. It may be a joyous and peaceful, whatever, may be a joyous and peaceful season for you and yours, and hopefully we'll share the next year together on these pages. <laughs> Feels weird reading a Christmas magazine, and it is currently the 1st of July, but that's the way it's landed. Out on a limb, and I mean a high. 
Okay, I'm fairly new to D&D, but I know a lie when I hear one, or more like cheating. People are playing high-level characters, and I mean high. Somebody was playing a 43rd-level fighter. He said he had rolled the character three years ago. This means he had to get 7,452.1 XP per day for three years. Not only that, he said, my fighter has so many experience points I can't keep track. I've heard and seen so many of these that I will go chaotic. Another example would be that somebody asked me, what is your highest level character? I have a sixth level cleric, I replied. He said, that's nothing. I have a magic user above the hundredth level. Yeah, yeah, look. When you have 11, 12, 13 year olds, nerds taking up a game for the first time, they like to show off. And DMs don't know what they're doing. I mean, it could be that DM had gone, you kill a rat, I give you two million XP. Or whatever. Or they could have just made it up. You don't, look, you don't know. It's, it's one of those things. And of course, they could just be lying. It doesn't matter, though, does it? It really doesn't matter. There's the letters page. And... There's more on page 44. Poisons from AA to XX. For every DM, there comes a time when he must deal with the question of the use of poison by player characters and non-player characters, other than assassins. Why not? Um, if the characters are evil... Um, if there's a purpose for using the poison. I had a party once who realised that there were basilisks in the compound for module A1. And they so they went and got some meat and poisoned it and threw it over the wall. Nothing wrong with that at all. That's clever play. Though he does mention that, like, thought of a single elf with a poison arrow felling the queen of chaotic dragons um look Tiamat's saving throws are going to be very very low Tiamat has a decent armor class and does she have the ability to cast spells I think so protection from normal missiles Plenty of ways a DM can stop that sort of thing. But if it happens, sometimes it happens. Such is life. So, it talks about different strengths of poisons. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. I like the idea of poisons having differing effects as well, not just outright just doing damage, because that's quite boring. Poisons can do more than damage. They can send you delirious, they can paralyze, they can drop you into a deep slumber where you get the most lurid dreams. There's all sorts of things poisons can do. Just go wild with your imagination. And antidotes as well, of course, antidotes. Weapons of the Far East, okay. Weapons of China, Tibet and Korea. Right, well, I'm I'm going to jump to the bit. Oh, it's on page eight, so let's see if I can find what I'm going to be specifically looking for. Advert village of Hamlet. Weapons of Japan. Here we are. Right. How much love were they giving the katana in this? That's the bit I wanted to look at. Uh, because there's a lot of mythology that surrounds the katana. People think, oh, they're such the greatest sword ever. Read this. The Japanese sword was one of the most perfect hand weapons ever produced by any nation. The Japanese pole arm ranks a very close second, preferred by many samurai to the sword. Well, don't they believe now that very few samurai fought with their swords because they were expensive and fragile. 
They were status symbols. The, the spear, or various spear variants, their glaive variant, the naginata, that sort of thing, they were more common, as long with the, along with the bow, because they were more versatile and more durable in combat and better defensively. So, isn't that the case? Don't, don't we now believe that the katana was much of a sidearm? The katana had issues as well. That whole folding thousands of times to make the iron better, it's because the iron ore was crap in the first place and they had to do that to get the impurities out, to bring the iron even remotely up to European levels. There's nothing mystical about the katana. It's a fairly heavy sword for its size, very poor hand protection, and... It's a very good slashing weapon against lightly armoured or unarmoured foes, but would be easily blunted against decent armour and is very expensive to get fixed. Very little thrusting capabilities and not the best balanced of weapons. I'd rather have a, a Langus Messer, personally, or... I'm trying to think, what, 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 what else? I mean, just the... The, the traditional knightly arming sword, I think, or the basket-hilted broadsword, or sabre, something like that, I think would be more more useful. But swords in general weren't great against anyone who was armoured. Anyway, let's move on, let's move on. Japanese weapons are pretty and they've got great names. The Daito or Katana was the longest sword. No, it wasn't. No, 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 no. No. They had a bigger sword than Katana, and its name escapes me at the moment. Um, this was the prime military sword of the samurai. Well, it may have been the prime military sword of the samurai, but it wasn't the prime military weapon of the samurai. I think this author's just sort of bought into a bit of the, um, I think it was his bibliography there, but bought into a bit of the, a bit of the nonsense that was going around. I mean, I'm not saying that I would happily mess with a samurai wielding a katana, but I would be more scared if they had a uh, spear or bow, because, uh, yeah. They were a bit good with those. A bit good. Sinister seaweed, aquatic encounters with megaflora. Giant water plants. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And now a message from our sponsors. Judges Guild. Ad adverts. Source of a scroll. Playing on the other planes of existence. Some people like that. I mean, Planescape was quite popular, wasn't it? Um, though the books go for a lot of money nowadays. I... I'm quite happy to make liberal use of little pocket demi-planes and things like that. But... I, I've never really been drawn in by... Um, a campaign spanning planes of existence maybe a quick foray here and there to some nightmare pocket plane but uh, I tend to prefer things grounded but hey ho everybody plays how they want to play a calendar ooh Sage advice from Gene Wells. Question. What kind of monster is on the cover of the Dungeon Master's Guide? What are its hit dice, armor class, and so forth? Answer. Answer. The monster is an Ifriti and can be found in the Monster Manual. Well, actually, its details can be found 
in the appendices of the monster man uh, of the DMG as well. So, but yeah, you get the monster manual and the dungeon master's guide, both great books. <laughs> Question Is a wand of fireballs like a staff in that if you break it, it will cause an explosion? Answer If you break your wand, all you will have is a broken wand. The only staves capable of a final strike are the staff of the Magi and staff of power. I suppose that's just a player trying to cheese things. If you meet these monsters, don't let them bug you to death. Right. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> I've just seen what they are. Insectoids. They're the product of crossing certain types of insects with certain types of goblinoids. Right. Scorpiork. Coasp. Untold. Wobblin. And Skag. Skag. What's a Skag? Right, let's have a look. Let's see what they are. Scorpiorks, obvious. Coasp, a kobold, and a giant wasp. Ah, okay. Antoid, Antold, giant ant, and a kobold. Skag is a cross between a few species scorpions, kobolds, ants, and goblins, being the most likely four. Woblins, wasp, and goblin. So, <clears throat> these are all. Lots of wasp ones there. Len, you got to think about wasps. I mean, they make good enemies. And yes, who doesn't like swatting a wasp or two? What's this alignment? E L E N. Evil, lawful, evil, neutral. Is that what you mean? Lawful, evil, neutral, evil. Then why did you put neutral evil over here? Mm, mm, not sure. Um, but no, crossbreeds... You, look, any mad wizard can make whatever crossbreed he or she wishes. Um, because they're monsters. They're monsters. It's when they start creating some sort of biological reason for them to exist that I start frowning and pulling a face and going Hurr. wizard variants some spells for the very smart sorcerer what game is this for Because it talks about IQ rather than intelligence. What's Iman doing in there? Hi. Um, more ads, more ads. The Druid in fact and fantasy. Excellent. Start off with talking about the Celtic culture. That is certainly an, an article to come back and read. Um, is William Fawcett uh, is William Fawcett the one who did the I'm going back up to the Japanese one uh, uh, Michael Clover so uh, it's Michael Clover who looks like he got a few bits and pieces wrong in the Japanese thing um, so I wonder what William Fawcett has to say about druids. Come back. I'll come back and read it. As we scroll down. A little map showing where they all hailed from. So we keep going. Big issue, this one. Big issue. International Dungeon Design Contest. That's what IDDC is short for. 
Okay, first place goes for Carl Maris. Morris, Maris. San Diego. With the, the Fell Pass. I don't recognise any of these names. I thought... Um, no, this this is after White Plume Mountain was first released. I know uh, the author of White Plume Mountain, Lawrence Schick. Yes, um, got a job as a result of a submission, but didn't know whether to do a contest or anything. Went to fantasy convention, traveller. Here's some traveller stuff for you, sci-fi fans. There you go, more Traveller stuff. Read it if you choose. Up to you. The Best of Boo Boo. No, it's not an article about Yogi Bear. It looks like it's fixing a... Uh, fixing a boo boo. Fix, fixing a, uh, a cock up. And it's raining outside. Here we go, more adverts. And now, okay, what's this? Chapter from the Fantasy Smith's Notebook. Pity the poor hobgoblin. Is there a reader who knows not the value of miniatures? Let him cease reading, lest he find out. Um... I understand the values, the value of using miniatures. I will say now, I prefer the style of play that comes from gaming without them. But I understand that sometimes you need them. So it's not objectively better, it's entirely subjective. So there. There's Druids, focusing on France. No, 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 focus on England. What's this? Oh, ah, right, okay, talking about Druidic temples. Some Druidic magic items. Not that they really had magic items, but... Items you can use in a game. Yes. Herbs. This looks like a really good article. Really, really good article. This is a sort of article I could imagine featuring in a MERP supplement. Where it goes into these sort of details. Well, almost all MERP supplements go into this sort of detail when it comes to regions of Middle Earth. You get lists of flora and fauna... Um, and all sorts of local details to help you use it in a game. Almost too much sometimes. Almost too much. But uh, WRG. Um, don't know what WRG is. Looks like it's a tabletop war game. Game review, Samurai, £13. Things that prices are going up across the board. Tw middle C, £20. <gasps> prices are going up. Prices are going up. Ooh, Dragon's Bestiary introduces the Crawling Claw. This is still in D&D &D nowadays. Um, and I think it's a great low-level monster. T tomb Guardian. A You can hide them in treasure chests. I've hid them in loose ceilings before. And if they listen carefully, all they can hear is this... <laughs> coming from the ceiling above. And if something happens, the ceiling gives way... And there's a shower of crawling claws that land on the party. <laughs> They're not powerful enemies, but 
if a low level party is suddenly showered in them, it can make some panic. Typical night in the life of nine ordinary people. Is this, oh, this is meant to be one of the funny things. Dragon mirth. Guarded. Treasure room. This way, free jewels and gems. No risk. And looks like someone's got a splat there. You know, I guess you can't believe everything you read, can you? Correct. Inert weapons or dangerous encounters. What? Carnivorous commode. Tiny thorn seeds used in heavy water. <laughs> the bath is a creature that consumes him. Okay. Carnivorous commode looks particularly evil. And there's wormy. Somebody moaned last time that you didn't get uh, wormy with my um, English twang. So here we go. I've got a theory. All these little blue devils came from hell. I don't know why me. I never saw any of them when I was down, down there. <laughs> well, the hell is one hell of a big place, little buddy. Suppose they got blown out of the deeps by some volcanic eruption. Suppose they got trapped in igneous formed geodes, which eventually were discovered by delving dwarves. Okay. Okay, okay, but how on earth are you gonna find? Are you gonna find out? An accent. I have no idea what that accent is. Simple imp. Just look inside for crystals. Chonk. Hmm. What is a pattern? Pattern in there. To hell with that theory. What's? What is that? Is what has he just cut open there? Dunno. Dunno. I'm I'm I didn't read last issue, so I'm I don't know what he's supposed what he's supposed to have found. It looks like a little gem of some sort with runes inside. Dunno. Anyway. Continuing Pity the Poor Hobgoblin from page thirty. That was the uh, treatise about uh, using miniatures. Out on a limb from page three. That's the letters page continued. We would just like to inform Mark Jacobs, whose letter appeared in Dragon number 28, that he is a expletive deleted. The beauty of D&D &D is that it's an open-ended game which may be interpreted in a wide variety of ways. Yeah. Yeah. None of this one true wayism. Too many on all sides who do that. Just enjoy the game. And there's a complete strategist. Micro subscriptions. I'm on page 48 out of 64 at the moment. The Fell Pass by Carl Meris. This is the winner of the um, dungeon design competition. This could be interesting. So I'm going to come back and have a look at this, I think. Um, what level is it for? Could I possibly use it? Ooh, convert it to bit, convert it to OSE and see how it behaves. Looks like it's low level because it's got giant bats. Oh, hang on, <laughs> ten ogres. Yeah, forget that. <laughs> forget that. <laughs> right, I'll come. I'll come back and read it anyway to see why it won. What was good about it? Players who ignore Vlog deserve no mercy. Vlog shall drink their blood. Yeah, looks like it's a mid-level, mid-level adventure. So you're talking like levels five and six, maybe higher. It's quite, it's quite significant. A beholder. Okay, so I'll be looking level seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe. It's a chunky adventure. It is chunky. 
There's lots of it. A bit about the author. Carl Merrius. And there's another map. And there's another map. Maps look nicely done. I don't remember seeing this cross-hatching style in early maps. Because everyone uses it nowadays. I've got a video on how to do it. But, uh, that could be... And, and it's a nice map presentation. I do like that. It's been well drawn. Okay, so, the Christmas edition of 1979 of the Dragon. What did I think to it? Well, love to see it finish with, a, with an adventure. Um, a 16 page long adventure as well so it was about the size of a lot of modules G3 was 16 pages G1, G2 was, were 8 each um, Village of Homlet was about 16 pages wasn't it, was it 24 uh, White Plume Mountain was a relatively thin booklet so it was about the size of a uh, of a module um Maybe a little smaller because the text in the modules was very, very, con con very dense at this time. But still, excellent. For your $2.50, you get a full adventure in there. And you get quite a wide spread of articles. Um, I am going to harp about the uh, Japanese one. It was, looks like it was a bit of a Katana fanboy who wrote it. Nice to see, nice to see something about the Druids. Um, I'm going to go back and read that. Uh and poisons, yep, in, in, encouraging variety in poison use. I, I like that. So, all in all, a solid way to end the year. Not the greatest issue of the dragon, but a good one all the same. I've enjoyed that. It's good. Keep going, dragon. Keep up this sort of general standard, and uh, White Dwarf is going to have a uh, bit of a job on its hands. Anyway, I've been the old geek. Hope you enjoyed this read through. See ya.